Now let's bring back our friend and economist, Peter Morisi. Peter Morisi is an economist and professor at the Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. His views are published weekly by Fox News and Newsmax, and frequently in the Washington Times, Baltimore Sun, and other leading newspapers. He's been with us now a few times on the income generation, and we're always delighted to have him back. Peter, welcome back to the show. Nice to be with you. Now, you published a, an article recently in the Washington Times entitled, Innovate or Vegetate? And you shared some thoughts in there about the debate of the tax plan, and now that's become the law of the land. What are your thoughts as to the actual effects that it can have in 2018? Well, I think the effects will be positive, and they won't be like anybody has predicted. You know, if you listen to the Republicans, they've, they've invented the equivalent of a cure to cancer. If you listen to the Democrats, you know, they're basically teaching people how to smoke. In reality, the tax cut will boost growth a bit. It won't boost it quickly, but it will, because the nature of the cut is so focused on investment, it takes time for the wheels to turn. So I think we can look forward to another year of good growth, and uh, I think that will continue. By the way, most economists are skeptical of that. They think that 2018 will give us another year of good growth, and then the economy will tail off, that it will be a classic Keynesian jolt, but that the notion that investment behavior can be permanently changed it seems to be lost on the profession. I don't agree. So you think that we'll get a little bit of growth in 2018 from the tax plan, and then that'll increase into 2019 and maybe even 2020. You think that's sustainable? Yes, I do. Uh, basically, I think that investment will, 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 take, will be lifted upward and stay upward, and that will have self-reinforcing effects. Of course. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I know the biggest benefit to the tax plan is really what they've been able to do for businesses to be able to stimulate the economy, purchase capital equipment, uh, hire more people, et cetera, et cetera. But on the individual side, which sector of individuals do you believe personally are going to be most benefited by this versus those that are going to benefit the least? The thing is, is that we have one of the most progressive tax structures in the world. And so more of the benefits are going to be at the top than at the bottom, simply because the top pays more income tax. Mm -hmm. But the top has been overtaxed, and that has discouraged investment and entrepreneurship by individuals. And this should help a bit. That business of, of the, the pass-through tax break, that is so focused on smaller businesses, you know, mm -hmm. those that right. with, 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 with incomes of three, with less than three to $400,000, if you're married and if you're single, much less than that that I really think that that was more a pacifier for Senator Johnson than having any really positive effect. But you think the benefit to big businesses, of course, is clear. That's obvious. It's just the small businesses you think is more of a placebo. So corporate entities, gotcha. the people that pay corporate taxes, it will have, have positive effects. The people that pay individual taxes, the tax cuts as a whole are not that large. Yeah. And so we're not going to get a mighty jolt out of so, it. So now I, I, I know, of course, you're <clears throat> with family over the holidays, and I know you have at least one liberal in the family. So when the arguments come up uh, over holiday dinner about things such as the deficit, we might have a trillion dollar deficit in the next year due to this. We can't keep spending money that we don't have. How do you respond to that? Well, they didn't ask me about it. I want to be clear. But my feeling <laughs> is that the... The tax cut will add about $500 billion to the deficit, as things are written now, over 10 years. That's $50 billion a year. That's hardly mega dollars. The bigger right. problem with the deficit is they keep increasing what they spend on both sides of the aisle. Uh, you know, for example, the Republicans are in, they want to spend more in the military, and they will. They, when the Democrats are in, they dramatically increased entitlements, entitlements mm -hmm. that shouldn't be given out, for example, to people that refuse to work. Uh, but whenever you talk to uh, talk about curbing, say, Medicaid, you know, Chuck Schumer rolls out stories of, of crippled women in wheelchairs who are who, who take special buses to work. No one's talking. And he did that. Literally, he told, tells this terrible, heartbreaking story of this paraplegic who, you know, uh, Mitch McConnell wanted to basically push out in the cold, cut off her rent and everything else. In reality, the Republicans weren't talking about that. What they were talking about is the adult who's 32 years of age, a guy, refuses to work, has no family responsibilities, lives in Bangor, Maine, and is being protected from the world by Senator Collins. 
Uh, that's where the problem is. But, you know, when we can't have an intelligent discussion, because the Democrats are convinced that if they just stonewall Trump and stonewall Ryan, they'll be rid of him in four years. And let's face it, Chuck Schumer and company are not interested in the welfare of the nation. They're interested in holding on to power. And for that, they need to run the cash machine, not do things that are constructive to growth. So, Peter, we need to leave it there and take a commercial break right now. Will you stay with us? You bet. You stay with us also, and we'll be right back with more from economist Peter Morisi. Welcome back. We're here with economist and financial expert Peter Morisi. Peter, you know, we kind of danced around this right before the break about the, the deficit and what the Democrats believe versus what the Republicans believe. But one big question, though, always bothers me. It, can we go into greater and greater debt perpetually? Oh, I don't know that we ever have to pay it off, but we do need to have it under control. My feeling is that it's growing too rapidly and the spending needs to be curbed. And we certainly can't afford any more tax cuts after the one we have until we get the economy growing at well more than 3%. The right way to deal with that is to look at how we spend and, and, and to cut what we spend. Now, the $500 billion you talked about after 10 years does not include extra infrastructure spending by President Trump. Is that correct? That's right. And they're going to have to find a way to pay for it because there were, there were two schemes they had in mind. One was to encouraging people to repatriate profits parked overseas. Well, they've done that in the tax bill, but they've also used that to pay for the tax bill. So, you know, that was partially how they, they came up with the revenue to cut corporate sure. taxes to 21. So that's not available. And the second right. thing is this notion of sort of privatizing infrastructure. I don't know many people that want to have parking meters on residential streets or have to pay to drive out their front door. And so roads are going to have to be paid for. And the only way they're going to be able to pay for that is two things. One is a higher gas tax, and the other is doing something about Davis-Bacon. You can't do something about Davis-Bacon without 60 votes in the Senate, so that's not going to get done. So we're going to have to have some road taxes. Other things they talk about privatizing, you know, like sewers and water companies and mm -hmm. what have you, that has generally worked out badly when it's where it's been done. Somebody from private equity gets a hold of it, piles it up with debt, pays himself really well, and maybe will run for president next year. But he leaves behind... <laughs> basically a lousy ambulance service or a broken water system. I mean, private equity cannot be trusted with public utilities. Let me, let me ask you this then, you know, GDP. Uh, we had terrible GDP right through the first quarter of this year. Last two quarters, it's stepped up. You know, can it sustain? It's been kind of sticking its nose right over that 3% mark for the last couple of quarters. Can it sustain? Can we reasonably hit the 4% that President Trump is hoping for? What are your thoughts? Oh, you could have a 4% quarter at any time, but my feeling is the best we can do right now is somewhere between 2.5 and 3%. What, what's, what's going on right now, we could have 3% from the fourth quarter as well. Uh, mm. It's hard to say, but it's in that range. But I don't think you can keep getting 3% quarter after quarter. For one thing, consumers are ahead of themselves, and they're going to take a breather. That's one of the reasons we have weak first quarters every year these days. Now, some economists have the weak quarter in the second quarter instead of the first one. Either way, right. there's going to be a bit of a swoon at some point. My feeling is growth will rebound to 3% again at that, and that the average for the year next year will be about 2.6. Which to me seems more practical, more reasonable than what, what many others are talking about. You know, well, one they're of my concerns that I... Well, in the White House. <laughs> at least, at least where Hassett sits, they're pumping it in. You know, I mean, if you listen to him these days, he never, whoever gave him a degree, ought to revoke it. <laughs> what one of the things that concerns me is the fact that we haven't had enough wage growth. It seems to me as though if people don't have extra money in their hands and they're getting older, they're realizing the need to save and invest, and they're not having enough income to save and invest and spend, then hopefully they're going to be prudent enough not to spend. Are you concerned about that factor at all, this lack of wage growth, and how do we overcome that? Well, I'm concerned about the lack of wage growth, but, you know, the markets are saying something. A lot of people are doing quite well, and a lot of people are doing poorly. And the people that are doing poorly, this is a very unpopular thing to say, in a lot of ways, they deserve it. 
in the sense that they're not terribly productive. Uh, you know, 40% of college graduates these days cannot engage in critical reasoning, critical thinking. That's the hallmark of a college-educated person. They basically mm -hmm. got big student loans from President Obama, went to second-tier colleges, took courses in the humanities, where they learned, you know, sort of feminist treaties, treaties feminist thinking about, about novels and, and, and what have you, <laughs> and, and don't have much useful to say. Uh, or do, they work in Starbucks, and that's about all they're good for. I mean, you know, they're the sorts of people that think if you double the minimum wage, that magically McDonald's will be able to give you the same hamburger at the same price. Uh, my feeling is a lot of people are stuck in these kinds of jobs because that's how productive they are, and there's not much we can do to boost their wages. You know, I, I, I see that, and there's certain positions where you have the ability to really create your own destiny. Uh, a lot of positions, though, are really, it's a situation where it's supply and demand of the job, job market. It seems like, you know, that should push wages up, just general supply and demand, but it's not happening. Why is that? Well, take the, take the clerk at McDonald's, the, the lady or the man that hands you a hamburger. If you substantially increase their wage with labor costs in the restaurant industry being somewhere between 25 to 35 percent of cost, you're talking about increasing the cost of a Happy Meal or what have you, or a, a basic uh, plate in a low-cost restaurant by, you know, 15 percent to, to 20 percent. We've, what we've seen in places like San Francisco where that has been mandated is that those restaurants end up closing. They have thin margins, and basically they can't push along higher prices. You know, I want to spend a few minutes talking about something that really has me up in arms a bit, and it's the fact that the Federal Reserve has raised short-term interest rates significantly, uh, not significantly, but, you know, a handful of times over the last two years, but yet the 30-year Treasury, for example, year-to-date has actually come down. And my question is, what's going to happen first? You know, is the Federal Reserve going to have to stop raising short-term rates? at risk of flattening out the yield curve, giving banks a huge disincentive to, land, to lend? Um, or is the bond market going to finally cooperate and release the pressure and allow long-term rates to come up? No, I think the, the yield curve is a symptom of what's going on, not a cause. Sure. Okay, It's something that we observe that's coincident with or occurs before a recession. First of all, the yield curve has given out false positives in the past, the first thing. The second thing is the okay. yield curve among economists that predict recessions is the 10-year versus 30-day Treasury rates. That's still at about right. one. It's not inverting, okay? Finally... But, it, but you have to admit it's flattening. Oh, it's getting yes. narrower. I mean, it, 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 of course I admit that's simply data. Mm. Uh, you're not sure. talking to the White House and you're not talking to, you know, the, the Clinton administration in exile. Uh, right. I, I do believe in data. But we have to ask ourselves, why is the long end of the yield curve coming unhinged from short rates? And the answer is, whenever U.S. long rates go up, a lot of foreign money comes in and pushes it back down. That's the first thing. The second thing is capital has become inherently cheaper in Western societies because of artificial intelligence, the imp prominence of intellectual property and investment and so forth. And we don't have time for that right now. But what that means is the world has too much capital. So much as wages have become unhinged from the unemployment rate and the Phillips curve, you know, doesn't exist anymore the way we, we, we thought it existed, mm -hmm. and the, the Fed needs a new model, likewise, investors need a new model when they look at the yield curve. My feeling is we shouldn't see a yield curve that's severely inverted, but the yield okay. curve getting flatter doesn't particularly trouble me. I look at other indicators with regard to the stock but, market and are very but, but, encouraged. But Peter, I would ask you one question though. In the 30 seconds or so we have left, how, how are banks going to be able to lend with a flat yield curve should that happen? Well, the reality you have to ask is the banks don't get their money from the Federal Reserve. They get their money from depositors. And they're simply going to pay rates that are lower than the federal funds rate. Uh, and they'll make their money on that, that kind of spread. But if banks, if people don't get money from banks, they'll do what they did right after the financial crisis. They'll get it in the secondary lending market. And that'll be available because there are people out there with great pools of cash laying around. I mean, have you known any unworthy corporations who have C-rated bonds that haven't been able to find buyers? 
Yeah, well, yeah, of course, of course. I mean, basically, you feel people are selling all kind of trash paper out there. What bothers me more is the fact that investors have been willing to buy that stuff rather than that they've been willing to lend. You, you feel that our banking system could very well change and adjust, that we could be looking at a new norm now uh, with flatter interest rates, and that's okay because the capitalist society, when there's a need that arises, capitalists come into the fray and figure out how to fill that need. Banks will have to change to survive, just as auto companies won't be making cars that use gasoline anymore in 20 years. I appreciate you being on the show today, Peter. It's been wonderful as usual, and thank you so much for being here. Take care.